ministry of praise. And this is just a, a, a deeper insight into um, the mystery of faith. After you have faith, what must come for afterwards is praise. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we're talking about the mystery of praise. Um, now, I must start by explaining this, that when we speak of praise, uh, often we use the terms praise and worship. Uh, they are not the same thing. Worship speaks of your lifestyle. Worship speaks of what you live for. We live for God, so therefore we worship God. Uh, our whole lives identifies with him because he is our idol. He is the one that we worship. Okay, But when we speak of praise, um, what we're speaking of is our words. Uh, pray, uh, praise has got to do with what you speak. Amen? Amen. So we're going to begin first of all in the book of Ephesians chapter, chapter 4. Amen. 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 Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29. Amen. Amen. So Ephesians 4, 28, 29 says this, Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful, so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear. Amen? Amen. So don't use foul or abusive language. And, and clearly, you know, despite the fact that you should know this as common sense as a Christian, you'll be amazed how many Christians are still cussing and swearing and cursing and using the Lord's name in vain. And yet the Bible teaches us so much that what comes out of your mouth is so important. Your mouth affects your whole body. Your mouth can affect your whole life. What you speak will affect you. It will affect your future. It will affect your family. What you speak. You know, you've heard maybe the example so many times of, of, uh, of parents who curse. Um, you know, and I've, I've got a neighbor um, who you can hear her and she, she swears at her door every night. Uh, cursing her. And what you don't realize is that those words, you can't take them back. Mm. And once you speak such words, it has an effect. Your words don't just go into the air. So as long as someone hears it, it will affect them. Amen? And there is an effect that takes place when you speak words, and that effect is a spiritual effect. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, you can just make a note of this. It says this, the tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. One. The tongue, your words, can bring death or life. That's pretty dangerous. It's pretty dangerous to think that what comes out of our mouth can bring death or life. Yeah. Amen? Amen. <coughs> And those who love to talk will reap the consequences. So there are consequences to what comes out of your mouth. Go with me now please to the book of James chapter 3. Verse 6 of 5. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire. For it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so, blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Amen? Amen? Wow. Listen to what it says. The tongue is like a flame of fire. It is inspired by hell itself. <coughs> you know, so often, and this is something which is a bit of a mystery to people, but it shouldn't be. So often, the things that is, what you see around you is a consequences of the words that you spoke yesterday. Amen. Amen. Listen to me now. What 
don't you accept? See, sometimes we, we, we have something that isn't perfect and yet we accept it. And then the moment you accept it, you say, you get comfortable in it and you say, well, it's okay because everything's going to work out just fine. I'm, I'm okay with this. You just confess that. The moment you confess that, that's all you want to get. Because God responds to expectation. And if you confess your expectation is only at this level, that is what you're going to get. God cannot give you anything greater because he only responds to faith. The Bible tells us without faith you cannot please God. And those who come to him must expect. So God must respond to your faith. There must be an expectation. And your words have to be in line with faith. If you accept what is of swine, then that's all you're ever going to have. But if you accept and you confess that which is of royalty, then that is what you're going to have. Are you understanding this? These are all talking about your words. What comes out of your mouth? Go with me now to the book of Matthew 15. And you know, just, just one other thing before we go to that. You know, I always tell people this, that when you are angry, that does not give you the right to speak in a way out of control. Mm. See, sometimes when we get angry, we like to say things that are just completely unlike us. Mm. And the moment you start to speak like that, you've lost control. Even if you're angry, you know, you hear people who they get angry and they say, I ain't going to church anymore. Or I don't believe in this anymore because they're angry. And then afterwards they'll repent. But your words have consequences. Do you understand? Just because you're angry, don't speak. If you're angry, uh, I, always, I always say this and, you know, to anybody. I say, look, if you're angry, then just keep your mouth shut. Don't say anything. Just close your mouth. It's better to go away and be by yourself. And close your mouth. But don't confess anything in anger. Because you're going to speak something that is inspired by hell itself. And then that word that you speak will then begin to destroy your life. And then all of a sudden, a week, a few weeks later, all manners of things are happening to you. And you're wondering why. What is your words? It's what you confessed. See, in, you need to understand that in the spiritual realm, the spiritual realm is ruled by laws. Okay? Uh, God sets principles. And no, nothing in all of the creation can break those principles. And the devil, Satan, he knows those principles. He knows his boundaries. He cannot step beyond his boundaries. But because there is a law, and he knows what the law is, so he cannot enter into your presence except he be given permission. Now when you begin to speak your words out of control, be careful lest you give him permission. And before you know it, he will slip in because you gave him permission. And then he'll begin to tamper with your life and you won't even know it. And things suddenly start to fall apart in your life and you haven't even realized it yet. Amen. How? Because of what you spoke. Do you understand? Amen. We've got to understand how the spiritual realm works. So it's in Matthew chapter 3. Chapter 15 and verse 11. Okay, it says this. And the tongue is a flame. Now, this is very important in scripture. I want you to remember this. If I can just find it. Okay, Matthew 15, 11. It says this. It's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. You are defiled by the words that come out of your mouth. If you truly and deeply understand this, you will never speak a word out of control again. Amen. Did you hear that? Amen. It's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. See, someone could be standing over you and cursing and cussing and saying you'll never amount to anything, you're full of evil, you're never going to be anything in your whole life. All of that don't mean nothing. 
that does not mean anything to you. It will not do anything to your future. See, people worry about curses. Curse has no power. Because a curse is what someone is speaking into you. That does not affect you. The only point where it begins to affect you is when you begin to confess it. The moment you begin to agree with it is when it begins to affect you. The moment you begin to say, maybe it's true. Maybe something is wrong with me. Maybe I am going to amount to nothing. And then you start to look at your life and say, well, look at my life. What's happening with my life? I'd have got you, you see. And the moment you begin to speak like that, see, it's not what comes into your mouth that defiles you, it's what comes out. Yeah. It's your confession. Are you understanding the word of God? Amen. So we need to understand the spiritual realm. See, the, uh, I say this all the time, we need to understand that there is a spiritual realm and we need to know how the spiritual realm works. And when we speak words out of our mouth, um, those words have both a, a natural consequence, um, which is, you know, natural things, but the, our words can also have what is called a spiritual consequence. And it is the spiritual consequence which is the one that begins to affect us and we don't even realize it. Because the spiritual consequence to your words, those are things that uh, when someone speaks, uh, when you, you confess out of your own mouth that I'm never going to amount to anything, there's a spiritual consequence to that. See, the natural consequence is that you become miserable but, and, and, you, and you look down upon yourself. But the spiritual consequence is that it's, you, you've just spoken into your future. And then that, the spiritual consequence is that your future is full of failure. And then maybe a few months later, you change your mindset. But those words are still ringing. Those words are still influencing your future. And so we have to be so careful, church. What we speak. That's why it's so necessary that when someone speaks such words like that, that they repent from it. They renounce it. Do you understand? That's, what's, that's why it's necessary to do renouncements. And sometimes we ought to do that. We ought to be renouncing all the time of what we've said. Father, I renounced. The other day, Lord, I spoke something and it was so terrible. Father, I just renounced that word. I don't want it no more, Lord. I just take it away from me. That's what renouncing means. Do you understand? And we've got to make sure that we're doing that because if you don't, you're saying things all the time and you're not seeing anything come out of it. Maybe you said something to your friend and you've not, and they seem to be fine. But what you just said, and you've just said something that's going to have a spiritual consequence. Do you understand? Amen. If they accept what you said, it's going to affect their lives, listening to what you're going to speak. Are you hearing the word of God? Yeah. See, this is why uh, God, he knew Job very well. And then when, when, when the Satan came and then God said to him, go and, and do what you want with Job. Just don't touch him. Don't lay a finger on him. But do whatever you want with him. And God had confidence in Job that Job, despite everything that he was about to go through, that the devil was going to bombard him with, God knew that Job would never speak a word outside of God's will. And so the devil came, and what did he do? He messed up all of Job's life. All his family were killed. All his business was killed. He lost all his homes. He lost all his finance, all his friends. And then on top of that as well, he had nothing left. He had absolutely nothing left. But he never spoke against God. Because that's the only thing that would have seen. See, sometimes we think, because things are not going well for me, the devil has got me. No, he hasn't. No, he hasn't. The devil can come over me and put sickness upon my body. He can put me on my deathbed. He can give me cancer. He can do whatever he wants to me. But I ain't going to agree with him. See, the only time where he has you is when you begin to think in line with the devil's will and you begin to speak in line with his will. That is when he's got you. It's not what comes into you that affects you. It's what comes out of you. Man can do whatever he wants to you, but I'm not going to confess it. Do you understand? See, your words affect you so deeply. I, I just wrote a few examples of the things that your words can cause. This is a short list. Sickness, condemnation, guilt, and some of you have experienced this before, sin, 
Your word can cause you to go deeper into sin. Failure, defeat, oppression, afflictions, strongholds, boundaries, soul ties, and even curses. Your mouth. That's why it says life and death is in the tongue. You can, if you speak such words all the time, think about it this way. When a man become, uh, uh, makes a covenant with the devil, and this, these things, we all know this is true, right? Does everybody understand this is true? When a man makes a covenant with the devil, what does he do? He speaks. Do you understand? He speaks. He confesses to the devil. He says, I, 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 I give you my soul. I give you my life. I worship you. His words. And because of those words alone, it causes such a spiritual thing to happen to the point where God has to let him go and he now becomes the, a child of the devil. And for all eternity, he's going to end up in hell. What caused it to happen? His words. He didn't go and kill someone. He didn't go and slaughter a whole, a whole nation. No, he just spoke. Life and death comes from the, the tongue. What you speak. Amen? Amen? I want to give you an example which is, which I just hope that you're going to understand. Go with me to Exodus chapter 12. And we're going to begin at verse 21. Are we all there? Amen. Now just to uh, explain, this, was, this is talking about the Passover. Um, we all know the story where when uh, God was going to pass over Egypt and it was going to slaughter all the firstborn sons and the firstborn animals of the Egyptians. Okay? And then he told the people of Israel to put blood on the doorpost and a lintel. Remember? Okay, so from, from verse 21. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel together and said to them, Go pick out a lamb or a young goat for each of your families and slaughter the Passover animal. Drain the blood into a basin, then take a bundle of high soap branches and dip it into the blood. Brush the high soap across the top and the side of your doorframe of your house. And, and no one may go out through the door until morning, for the Lord will pass through the land to strike down the Egyptians. But when he sees the blood on the top and the sides of the doorframes, the Lord will pass over your home. He will not permit his death angel to enter your house and strike you down. Okay? Okay. Uh, now, this is the revelation that the Lord gave me, which I shared with uh, the group on Sunday. God's condition was put the blood on the doorposts, okay? So that when the angel of death comes over, he will not enter into your house. No, in other words, no disaster will come into your house. Now, the blood speaks of the blood of Christ. And then it said, eat the flesh, eat the animal. And don't leave anything till the morning. The animal speaks of the body of Christ. Christ in you. That's why they had to eat it into their body. Okay? And the blood speaks about the blood of Christ. But then, and most Christians have that. Most of us, we've got the blood, we've got Christ in us. But then he also gave another condition. He said, make sure that no one leaves. No one opens their door and steps out of that house. Do you understand? There were three conditions that God gave. He said, put the blood, eat the animal, but everybody forgets about the third one. No one opened their door. And this is what the enemy is looking for. He knows that you're cleansed by the blood of Christ. He knows that you've got Christ inside of you. He knows he can't touch you. But if he can get you to open the door, he can get you. And how do you open the door? Guess what? Your mouth. What you speak. You are filled with the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues every day and then one day you go to work and then someone upsets you and then before you know it, you start cursing. And then, and then you say, what, what am I doing? Why am I talking like this? You just open the door. You just open the door. And remember what I said, there are laws in the spiritual realm. God's law was a Get the blood, eat the animal, don't open the door. If, you, if one of those Israelites opened the door and they stepped out, just as the, the death angel was passing by, guess what was going to happen? They were going to fall down and die. The death angel would have entered into the house and gone straight for the eldest son. And he would have died. 
go straight for the firstborn animals and they would have died. The curse would have come upon them despite the fact that God never wanted it to. But he set his principles. That's his law. Do you understand? So it's necessary, therefore, that we need to make sure that we are abiding by God's word. That what comes out of our mouth has to be in line with God's word. I don't care what you are going through. That gives you no reason to confess what is not biblical. You've got to confess what God says. And that's what that illustration of, uh, of that act was trying, to, it was trying to show. Do you understand? The moment she started confessing what the, what the enemy was saying, she started feeling the pain coming back. And the moment she turned away from it, she said, no, the Bible said this. Jesus said I am healed. And then the enemy started backing away. Your words can affect you so deeply, far beyond what you can imagine. It can destroy your whole life. The Bible says that the tongue can set your whole life on fire. It would affect your whole future. It will affect your family. You've been opening doors so much, and this is the thing, right? He said, don't open the door. No one leaves the house. What would happen if someone opened the door? It will not just affect you. It will enter into your house and affect your whole family. So your words can affect your whole family. It can affect people around you just because you cannot control your words. Likewise, if you have someone in your household who does not control your words, your words, if you speak in line with God's will, will, will go against whatever they're saying. Do you understand? Amen. Because the Bible tells us that the word of God is what? It's a sword. It's a spiritual sword. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. So no matter what the enemy is doing in your life, if you speak in line with God's word, even if you don't feel like it, even if you don't have no strength, you don't have no stamina left, even if you're lying there and you can barely even stay awake, you've got nothing left inside of you except from this confession. And you're there half asleep and you're still saying, I'm healed in the name of Jesus. Blessing will follow me in the name of Jesus. Do you understand? Amen. So many of us, we, we, we um, what's the word called? We underestimate the word of God. We underestimate it. We think it's nothing. Yet Paul said, I'm not ashamed of it. For it is the power of God unto salvation. The word of God is the power of God. It is the power of God. His word is alive and it is powerful. Amen. And if I speak his word, anything that's around me must obey because God is the master, the creator of all. So if I can speak his word and I stand in the name of Jesus, it must obey me. We must not underestimate the word of God. I want you to write this down. I am covered by the blood I have Christ within me. So I am covered by the blood. I have Christ within me. But if I step out of the door, I am in the danger zone. I want you just to reflect in your own life and think about how many times you've opened the door to the enemy. Think back. How many times God is saying you can do it. And then you stand there and say, I can't do it. How many times have you opened the door with your mouth just because you could not keep your mouth closed? How many times? Think where you could be if you spoke in a way that's in line with God's will. Think about the blessing you could have. Think about the victory. You know, God's desire is that we should always reign in victory. Church, listen to me. God's will is that we should always have peace. He said, enter into my rest. His desire is that we should always be healed. We should always go into, for, uh, from glory to glory. We should be the head and not the tail. And the blood of Christ and Christ in me is my guarantee. Until you open the door. So the thing that causes so many Christians to not enter into all of God's uh, plan for them is because they don't speak in line with God. You're not in agreement with God. Your words are not in agreement with Him. 
But if you change your words and you start to confess what is true, guess what happens? Your enemy begins to back away. And we see this perfect example after Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. And the way he counteracted this, uh, uh, the, the devil was he said to the devil, it is written. What did he do? He confessed the word. And yet, some of you, when you're there in your bedroom confessing the word, you're feeling as if this is stupid. Jesus didn't think it was stupid. He said to the devil, it is written. The devil's there pricking you every single day. And then you feel stupid to confess the word of God. The moment he's pricking you, the more you say, it is written. I'm healed, it is written. I have victory, it is written. Do you understand that? So it's important and necessary that we know how to confess the word. If you cannot confess what God's word says, then don't speak anything. You know, the world tells us all the time, if you've got nothing good to say, don't say anything. And people like to, they like to, um, people like to tell other people how they feel. When they're not going through a bad, uh, when they're going through a bad time, they like people to know about it. They like to tell people, they like to tell everybody. You know, don't tell them, stop telling people. See, this is the thing that opens, and see, this is why I said, your words can also create curses and soul ties. See, you're going to someone who you don't know what's their spirit, and then you'll say to that person, pray for me. Now, if their spirit is not of God's spirit, guess what happens? Soul tie. Because you've given whatever spirit is in them legal permission to enter your life when you say, please pray for me. And whatever spirit is in them will then begin to affect you. Do you understand? Amen. Curses. And that's how you have Christians who should be walking in victory. Instead of walking in victory, walking in misery. Amen. Walking under curses. Do you understand? Amen. The mouth. Amen. It is like a flame of fire is inspired by hell itself. It is so dangerous what you speak. Amen. Psalms 19, 14. May the words of your mouth and the meditation of my heart. So may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Can we say amen to that? Amen. That's a prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Wow. And this is the meditation of my heart. That is the thing that you're always thinking of. Mm -hmm. The thing that's always going through your mind. See, don't be thinking negative. Your, your, your words and your thoughts has to be pleasing with, to God. Mm -hmm. And the only way your words and your thoughts can please God is if you your words and your thoughts are in line with God. I like you to take notes of what I'm going to say next. I want you to mark again, uh, to write again, Matthew 15 and then I'd like you to read this again when you're going through your notes. And this again speaks of what is not what goes into your mouth that defiles you, it's what comes out of your mouth. Amen? Amen? This is why it's so necessary, church, that we stand in line with God's word, with what God's word. We confess God's word. Doesn't matter what you see, doesn't matter what you feel, doesn't matter what people say, what's going to come out of me is what God says. Okay? Amen. Now, pay attention to this now. This is why I was teaching the church also on Sunday. Every single structure, okay, has a foundation. Everything has a foundation. Okay? Because everything in existence has a beginning. It has a base. It has a root. Even the air itself is a structure. It has a foundation because it came from somewhere. See, air, air's foundation is not the floor. Air's foundation is whatever, wherever it came from. Okay? That's the foundation. That's the root of it. Do you understand? If we think about the ocean, ocean has a foundation. What's the foundation of it? It's the bottom of the ocean. That's what holds it up. If the ocean floor was not there, the ocean would just keep on going down. Okay? Everything has a foundation, even spiritual things has a foundation, it has a beginning. Are you understanding that now? Now, go with me now to the book of Daniel. Remember what I said, everything, and when you're there, just hold that page. Everything has a foundation, everything has a beginning. 
That means this, Judge. Sickness has a foundation. Disease has a foundation. Problems have a foundation. Curses have a foundation. Every problem that you could ever possibly go through has a foundation. Every challenge has a foundation because it is a structure. Okay? Now, I want, you to, I want to read this to you to show you how God deals with it. How God deals with the structures, the problems in your life. Okay? So we're beginning from verse 31. Everybody there? Amen. Now, this is Daniel interpreting King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He says, In your vision, your majesty, you saw standing before you a huge shining statue of man. It was a frightening sight. The head of the statue was made of fine gold. Its chest and arms were silver. Its belly and thighs were bronze. Its legs were iron. And its feet were a combination of iron and baked clay. As you watched, a rock was cut from a mountain, but not by human hands. It struck the feet of iron and clay, smashed them into bits. The whole statue was crushed into small pieces of iron, clay, bronze, silver, and gold. Then the wind blew them away without a trace, like chaff on a threshing floor. But the rock that, that knocked the statue down became a great mountain that covered the whole earth. Okay? Did you read that? Yeah. Now, this is what I wanted to capture from this, from this, pa from this passage. This statue represents um, uh, kingdoms, nations, but we're not going to go into the representation of it. But this statue is a structure. Just like sickness, just like curses, just like problems that you go through, it all has a structure and it also has a foundation. Do you understand? Now, when God wanted to destroy this foundation, what did he do? He cut a rock out of a mountain. When did he throw the rock? At the feet. He didn't throw the rock at the head. He threw the rock at the feet. What are the feet? The foundation. Do you understand? Now, whenever God wants to deal with any problem in your life, what he deals with is the foundation. Once God destroys the foundation, if the enemy is rising up against you, coming against you, stress, worry, fear, panic, sickness, and God wants to deal with it, God attacks the foundation of it. And when he deals with the foundation, what happens? The statue then begins to crumble. Okay? Now, every single, this is going to, it's really going to bless you, and it, it blessed the guys on Sunday. Every single foundation in your life is a statue. And when God de destroys the foundation, it falls down, it crumbles. But this is the thing that we need to remember, is that every single statue, every single foundation, every problem, when God deals with the foundation, they all fall at a different speed. Okay? Now this is where people, they lose faith. You, you come to church, you get prayed for. The moment you get prayed for, God has dealt with the foundation. The foundation has been destroyed. And then now you've got to wait for the statue to fall. When that statue is falling, you've got to hold on to your, the word of God. The, the more you hold on to God's word, the more that statue is falling. The moment you start to speak against God's word, guess what happens? The foundation comes back. And that statue begins to rebuild. Are you understanding the word of God? Amen. See, for example, some of you, maybe you, you, you're going through financial problems. And then you pray and say, Lord, I need financial solution. And you pray about that. Lord, just take away poverty from my life. The moment you pray that prayer, the Bible tells us that God hears that prayer. He says, ask of me whatever you desire, and I will give it to you. The moment you pray, Lord, I don't want poverty in my life, guess what God has just done? The moment you pray that prayer, he's destroyed the foundation of poverty. The root of poverty, the seed of poverty in your life. Maybe poverty has been throughout all of your generation, all of your families. Okay? And the moment you pray that prayer, God destroys the, the, the curse of poverty in you, the foundation of it. But then you're looking at your life and saying, but I'm, I still ain't got a job. I'm still poor. I still can't afford things. And then you start thinking, well, maybe God didn't do it. Because I can still see that I'm still poor. But what you don't understand is that God did hear your prayer and he dealt with the foundations. All you've got to do is wait. The Bible tells us after you've done all that you can do, stand. Amen. Just stand. If you 
you've got nothing good to say, keep your mouth closed. God is working. Don't interrupt with what God is doing. If you, if you get prayed for or you pray a prayer, then hold on to that word. And if you've got nothing good to say, don't speak anything because it's going to interfere with what God is doing. God is breaking down that foundation right there. And then until you then get involved with it, he said, he said, keep that door shut. And then you open the door, you mess up with what God is doing. Are you understanding that? John 14, 13. If you just make a note of that, I'm going to read it. It says this. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it. Amen? Amen. That is a promise. That's a promise that Jesus has made to every single one of us. He's given to us his name. And his name has all power, all authority. And if we can speak in line, if we can call out his name in faith, whatever we should ask for after that, he will do it. What will he do? He will deal with the foundations. Are you understanding that? I want you to write this down as well. What can I do to make the structure or the problem in my life to fall even faster. Do you all get that? Yeah. So what can we do to make that structure? God is dealt with the foundation. Now that structure is falling, but it's taking too long. One week later, I'm still seeing the problem. Two weeks later, I'm still seeing the problem. Three weeks later, I'm still seeing the problem. Two months later, I'm still seeing the problem. What's wrong? What's happening? What's the problem? Because if God dealt with the foundation, that structure should be falling straight away. So why is it taking so long for the prayer to be answered? It's your words. It's your words that slow it down. Church, please listen to me. Your words will slow down the miracle. Your words. Amen? Amen. Write this down as well, please. I hope those of you have heard this word already. This is still blessing you. Amen. My words can determine how fast or slow it will take for the structure to fall. My words can determine how fast or slowly it will take for the structure to fall. Ain't that amazing? Amen. Your words. And what's the quickest way to make that structure fall? Somebody tell me. Praise. Praise. Praise is the fastest way to make any, any structure fall. If you ever get prayed for or you pray for anything, understand this. You've come to God. You've sincerely seeked him for something then you have expectation that he has done it. If you truly believe he has done it, what's going to naturally follow after that? You're going to say, Father, thank you. Do you understand? That's the next thing that has to come is praise. You need to start praising him for what he has done, even before you've seen it. If you pray for anything, believe that you have it even before you've seen it. Stop acting like it is yours, even if you can't hold it. Start confessing what you have, even if you've never seen it. The Bible tells us something that, that God, he calls the things that are not as if they were. Do <clears throat> you understand? Yeah. That is how we should operate. Call the things that are not as if they were. I don't see a solution to my problem. But I know a solution is there. I don't know how I'm going to get through this battle. But I already have the victory anyway. Get into the habit of always speaking what God thinks of you. Because the Bible tells us that God has thoughts concerning you. If God's thoughts concerning you are good things, 
And then the only confessions that you have concerning yourself are bad things. There's a contradiction. You're not in line with God. Because God never thinks anything of you that is a failure. He never thinks that. God never ever thought when he created you that this my daughter, this my son will be a failure. He never ever thought that this my daughter, this my son is going to be misery. He never thought that. So if you have misery or you have failure, it is the root of something else. It's not from God. So what have you got to do? Start speaking in line with God's word. Are you hearing that? Amen. Can we say thank you, Jesus? Thank you, Jesus. You begin to see how much God is so powerful. You see there's a solution. If we can only have expectation, hold on to that word, praise God, before we've ever seen anything, victory is guaranteed. Amen. Overcoming is guaranteed. Amen. Miracles are guaranteed. Are you hearing this? Amen. Praise. We've got to praise him. Even when we give testimonies, when we testify of what God has done, we're praising him. And the more you're testifying of what God has done, the more the devil's backing away because he can't stand it. He cannot be in the presence. Imagine, you know, the devil is there trying to prick you, trying to poke you. And the more he pokes you, the more you say, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. He can't stand it. See, he wants you to get negative. He wants you to start thinking what's going to happen. He wants you to start getting a little confused and worried and concerned. That's what he wants. But the more he starts beating on you, the more you can't see how you're going to get yourself out of this situation, the more you begin to praise God anyway. Amen. And say, Father, I thank you anyway. I can't see any way out of this, but I'm going to thank you anyway, Lord, because you have a way out of this. Do you understand? Amen. That's how Christianity is really supposed to be. Let's go now to Revelation chapter 12. I'm going to speak to somebody in this room right now. Get every concern out of your mind. Let God do what God is doing. That's a word I'm giving to someone for right now. I'm not going to call out any names. Stop worrying. Let it go. God is doing something. You listen to God now. Okay, Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. It says this. That I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens. It has come at last. Salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth. The one who accuses them before our God day and night, and they have defeated him by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony. And they did not love their lives too much that they were afraid to die. How did they defeat the enemy? Two things. By the blood of the Lamb, and they didn't open the door. Remember what I said? You're covered by the blood. You've got Christ in you. But keep that door shut. Amen. So they defeated the enemy because they confessed, tes they testified of God. Mm -hmm. They kept not giving God praise. They didn't start speaking negative and open the door for the enemy. So they defeated him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Mm -hmm. Their mouths, what they spoke, that's what overcomes the enemy. Are you understanding this now? Amen. Everything, understand this, church, everything that opposes you. Everything that is to bring you down, everything that's not to encourage you, everything that is to destroy you, everything that is to bring poverty in your life, anything that is negative that comes upon your life is from the devil. And you will overcome it because you have the blood of the Lamb sanctified and by the word of your testimony. What is my testimony? Jesus has set me free. Amen. I have victory in the name of Jesus. Amen. That's your testimony. So you overcome the devil by your words. Amen. So the other side of that obviously is the devil overcomes you by your words. Amen. Do you understand this now? Amen. Luke chapter 10. Let's go to that. 
verse 16. And this was when Jesus sent out 72 ahead of him to declare his word, to prepare the way for his coming. Do you know the story? So it says this, then, G then he said to the disciples, anyone who accepts your message is also accepted me, and anyone who rejects you is rejected me, and anyone who rejects me is rejecting God who sent me. 17. When the 72 disciples returned, so they've already been, now they're coming back, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. Then he, then he told them, this is Jesus speaking, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Amen? Amen. So this was when the disciples, uh, the, the, the 72 that God had, that Jesus had chosen, he sent them out to go and declare the kingdom of God. And he, he sent them ahead of him because he sent them to every town where Jesus was going to go, he sent them ahead of him to declare and make the way. Okay? So they went testifying. They came, they went with a testimony. And when they were there test, testifying, giving praise to God, what did Jesus see at the same time? He saw the devil fall. Mm -hmm. Amen. Do you understand? Amen. So their testimony, their words, their declarations is what caused the devil to fall. So that tells you therefore once again that if you cannot speak what God is saying, if you cannot testify of what God is speaking, you cannot overcome the devil. And it's, it's black and white. There's no other way. It is a principle that cannot be shaken. And sometimes you're trying to help someone who's going through something and you're trying to tell them, listen, start confessing the Bible. Start confessing in line with God's word. And then they keep speaking. I don't know. I don't think I can do it. I don't know what's going to happen to me. And you can't help them because they've got to learn to start speaking in line with God's word. I shared with the church this testimony um, what happened to me when I, at work I injured my back. I was, I was stretching out trying to lift something and I stretched too much and I injured my back and it was pretty bad. The, the next day I, I, I thought I'd, let me just sleep and, and it'll go. I woke up and I couldn't move. And I called my wife over and I said, look, we've got to deal with this because this is bad. So I sat down and then she prayed for me. And I held on to that God, to God's word, and she said, "No, get up and test that." I got up, and the pain almost completely left me. There was hardly anything left. I was able to twist and to bend, and the whole day I couldn't move. And I knew this was pretty serious. The whole day I couldn't move. And then, within a few hours after she had prayed, and the pain left, it came back again, and it came back almost as bad as it was before. But I didn't, I didn't go to her straight away. I said, no, I'm just going to hold on to it. If it carries on, then obviously go and ask and pray again. But I said, no, I'm going to hold on to God's word. I'm healed in the name of Jesus. And I said, but I went to work the next day. And I, and I said to myself, and look, by the time I finish my job, this pain is going to be gone. I finished work. On the, way bus, on the way back on the bus, it was still there. The next day, I said, it's going to be gone. And it was still there. Three days later, I was still holding on to that word. It was a battle, I tell you. I could have started confessing all the negative things and that pain would have just come straight back. Mm -hmm. I held on to God's word. By the third day, every pain left me. And mm -hmm. since that day, it never came back. But there was something that I did, and this is why I, this is why I didn't tell the church on Sunday. There was something that I did every morning, every single morning, because sometimes in the morning, if I'm, you're late for the bus, you're just going to run. And then no one can see you, so there's no shame in it. So you just go run for the bus. <laughs> Some of you may understand that. There's no shame with that. <laughs> Amen. So you got to run for the bus. you got to run for it, right? And I'll be running for the bus. I, and this was during the time of the pain. And I was still feeling this pain. And I'll be running. And as I'm running, and this may sound silly, but I'll be speaking to myself. And as I'm running, I say, look, see, devil, someone who's got back problems cannot run like this. And every morning, I'll be running, and, and when I go to work, I'll bend down to lift something up. I say, you see, devil? Someone who back on can't lift up things like this. I've been taunting him. And I did this every morning, every single morning. And by the third day, guess what? He gave up. Amen. I won. Amen. Do you understand? Amen. You've got to hold on to the word of God. Amen. It is a guarantee. It is the power of God. 
The power of God is not a lightning. It's not a fire. It's his word. Amen. Are you understanding this? It is his word. And what did he tell us? He said, I have, I have written my law, my word in your heart. I've put my word inside of you. He, what he said, I've put my power inside of you. How do you use it? Open your mouth and speak. Amen. Amen. Speak what you desire. Amen. And in my name, I will do it. Amen. Do you understand? Amen. So that the Son may be glorified. Amen. You see how easy it is. This is what makes me so excited. And this is why when we, when we captured this revelation, any single thing that came up against us, any pain or anything, this is what I started telling you. Straight away, we can't wait. Right, let's pray about it. Let's do it. I want to release the power of God. And when this guy called us and he said in his prayer, we were so excited. And then we sent us an email said he's got a problem with his neck and his back. And the moment he, we saw this email, we said, it's done already in the name of Jesus. Amen. It's already done. And sure enough, it only took us a few <coughs> minutes. And within a few minutes, pain that had been building up for years, within seconds, gone. The word of God is the power of God. Amen. Don't underestimate it. Amen? Amen. Hold on to his word. Just one more scripture I want to show. Okay, let's go to Joshua chapter 6. And verse 1. Joshua 6 verse 1. Is everyone there? Now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. No one was allowed to go out or in. But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king and all its strong warriors. You and your fighting men should march around the town once a day for six days. Pay attention. Verse 4. Seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, each carrying a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you are to march around the town seven times with the priests blowing the horns. When you hear the priests give you one blast on the ram's horn, have all the people shout as loud as they can, then the walls of the town will collapse and the people can charge straight into the town. Amen? Amen. This passage is packed with revelation. Okay? First thing we need to pay attention to is this. So these are, uh, uh, Joshua's leading the people of Israel into Jericho, right? They just left Moses. Moses didn't enter it. He just, he just died. Okay? And then, so they, they, they cross over the river and then they're going towards Jericho. And this is this mighty city with big walls that cattle fall. No one can ever break through those walls. They shut the gates because they're protected by their walls, by their structure. Okay, now how did God deal with that? The first thing that God said to them before they before that wall even fell down, He said to them, What well, I have given you, Jericho. Amen. That word, when God said to them, I have given you Jericho, let's just quickly go to it. Right, He said, This I have given you Jericho, its king. And all his strong warriors. That means that he tells he tells look everything about Jericho. All of Jericho's defenses have given it to you. What's he talking about? What he's saying is, I have destroyed the foundation. Amen. I've dealt with the foundation. It's yours already. See, that's why when God pray, you, you, God does something for you, or you pray about something, God has given it to you. He's dealt with the foundation. But though God gave them the, the get, God, God gave them Jericho. The walls were still there. They hadn't even crossed over yet. Do you understand? The walls were still there, but God already said, it's yours, I've given it to you. And so what did they do? When they came to Jericho, did they come to Jericho thinking, oh, hold on for a minute, what's God talking about? I still, I still feel the pain. I can still see the wall. No, what did they do? They went to Jericho, believing, expecting, it's mine. Despite the fact that they could still see these huge walls. Imagine that. 
Can you imagine that? But then what's the next thing that happened? God sent him to go around for six days. And on the seventh day, the priest blew the ram's horn. And then they all started shouting. And like I said, it doesn't say what they were shouting, but I believe that they were shouting praises to God. And then what happened? The wall crashed. When you pray, God deals with the foundation. What must follow afterwards is you hold on to that word as you're approaching that wall. When you get to that wall, start praising. No matter what it is, this is guaranteed. No matter what it is, it will crumble. Because the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. It all belongs to God. At the sound of his name, Every knee should bow. Every tongue will confess. Nothing can resist his name. If you believe enough, you can command the mountains to move. If you believe enough, you can command the tree to be uprooted and planted into the sea. If you believe enough, you can deal with anything. But what is required is not only faith. You see, some of us, we, we like to cry and moan about this. and say, but I have faith. Yeah, you have faith, but did you hold on to that faith? Did you praise God? See, that's the thing. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. I have faith. How long did I have faith for? For a whole week I was holding on to that faith. What if you had to hold on for another week? What if that, that wall was crumbling down and just as it was getting to the bottom and then you start saying, but I've been holding on for a whole week. And the moment you said that, it just goes back up again. And you say, oh, it never happened. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So the key is we've got to be able to hold on to God's word, which is the mystery of faith and we've got to pray it. the mystery of praise hallelujah Amen. can we give the Lord thanks Amen.